My name is Mol Morni. Uh, I come from Brunei Darussalam. Uh, the system which I teach is uh, Silat Sufian Beladiri. At the moment, I'm the chief instructor for the system. Living in Brunei, you, it's like you live in this protective bubble where everybody is respectful to everyone and things like that. It's amazing to grow up in Brunei because uh, growing up, we were not exposed to the news from outside. So growing up, we were never, how to say this, we never looked at anybody in any other way as a person. But and then when I was abroad, you see how there are some people who are divisive in terms of racial, in terms of faith and things like that. So they try to divide the community. And back home in Brunei, we don't have that because we are monarchy and the Sultan tries to keep the peace for everybody. Until I went out of the country, uh, studying abroad, I never knew there was a problem with Israel and Palestine. I never knew there was like um, a war between Shia and Sunni. Because back home, we lived tolerance and harmony with like Chinese, Indian, uh, the local natives, the Malays, and we've got Filipinos in Brunei as well. We've got other people, especially in my district, uh, we have a lot of expats uh, because that's where the oil is. So for me, when I was growing up in Brunei, we have a lot of Gurkhas as well, Nepalese. When did you leave Brunei? I left Brunei in 1999 to study in, in the UK. Uh, for university. Okay. Yes. And then when did you return to Brunei? I never did. <laughs> because after I finished, um, I started to travel to teach and things like that. But it was two choices. I either come home and work in Brunei or I continue traveling around the world and getting paid for doing what I love, which is beating people up. <laughs> so I, before the martial arts training, I was really an angry child. So basically, I like to pick fights in school, but, but it's children now. So it came to a stage where my grandfather got involved, saying that, you know, I think you need to train martial arts because you have so much anger in you, so much. I think I was happy active, one of those things. Plus, I get frustrated a lot for nothing because I was a child. Silat was my first art. I trained under my grandfather um, and I started very young. And the thing is, when I was training Silat, it was not for fighting, it was not for self-defense. It was mainly for discipline. That's how when you see me move, it's the discipline is there. So everything was to teach you patience, to teach you, um, you know, when you repeat, for example, you have to drill a certain move over and over and over again. While, while my friends were doing Taekwondo, were doing Karate, they were having like, after two months, they had a different belt. After six months, they had a different belt. After three years, they had a black belt. As for me, I was doing the same thing for six months. So basically, I drilled the same movement, drilled the same movement until it became effortless. Then we continued to the next stage of training. So when I was training martial arts, mainly it was a way for my elders and my grandparents to teach me discipline and patience. So imagine a small child has to do things over and over again without questioning, without getting annoyed. Yes, and then after that, I get to channel all my energy into martial arts. After training, I'm always chill, I'm always relaxed. So that's why when you see me train, I'm really intense because that's how I tra was trained when I was young. But then after the training, it feels like the whole world is taken, you know, you have everything on your shoulder and then everything is taken off your shoulder. So that's how I feel. Yeah, uh, my grandfather is Haji Yusuf Haji Dagong. And he, he also trains other Sila system when he was young. Uh, but when I was training with him, it, there was no system. He was, he was training, he was disciplining me through the martial arts. So, there so wasn't like a specific name for that Silat system? No, 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 there was not. He, he just said, uh, let's train. So when he was younger, he did boxing. That's why when you see I hit, I hit with a very strong right. Yes, um, and, but his Silat system is all grounded. So grounded, not on the ground, but grounded that you don't jump, you don't do wushu stuff, you don't do excessive stuff because the way he sees it, 
if somehow somebody breaks into your house and you need to break their face, you should be able to do that even being woken up in a second. So were you always interested in martial arts? Or was it no, that was like no, no. Like it was, no, to be honest, I didn't see martial arts as martial arts. I saw it as like a way to discipline me. So when I was doing it, it was discipline, like physical education, discipline. That's how my grandfather taught me. So he wasn't teaching me how to defend myself, but the movement is there. So basically, when somebody does this to you, you evade, you pull back, you do this, you push. So that's why when you see me teach, I don't talk about kill this guy like this. You know, this is how you break his neck. This is how you punch him in the heart and take his heart out. I don't talk like that. So basically, it's all, this is how you off-balance him. This is how you break structure. This is how you hyperextend his elbow to push him there. And this is where you sweep. So basically, that. So none, none of the violent stuff because I don't think your grandfather wants to teach you anything violent you know, because it always comes back to him if anything happens. Yeah. So you're never like, oh, I saw that movie. I want to start studying. No, no, because um, you know as you train and then you see Jackie Chan, you see this, you know you'll never be able to do things like them. But because when you train, you know your limitation. And then when you see them and then you started to do all this like jumping up and then my, grand my grandfather would say, oh, what's going on here? I was like, why are you jumping up and down? We don't do that. Uh, silat is the general term uh, for, any, for the art. So basically like Kali, Eskrima, Karate, Taekwondo. Uh, if you ask anyone or any elder what silat means, they will have their own interpretation. Uh, I don't know, I just, I'm not a historian or I don't learn what words mean. So basically silat for me silat. So a bit like we have Silat, we have Kuntao in Brunei. The Kuntao is the Malay uh, influence of whatever this. People say it comes from China. Maybe it does, maybe it didn't, but it has a strong influence of the Malay culture. So Silat in Brunei is Silat and Kuntao. That's the two at which people train. Yeah. So what does the word uh, Sufian Kalaji Sufian is the name of the system. Like for example, if you say uh, Karate, Shotokan Karate, or Kyokushin Karate, that's the name. So Sufian is the name of the system, Beladri means self-defense. The thing is, it's not a fighting art because I was never taught to fight. So, but interpreting the movement that I was taught, I can use it in self-defense. It's a bit like Kung Fu. So if you go to China, there's Kung Fu systems like, I don't know the name, but the ones I know, Hungar, Praying Mantis, Wing Chun, so it's like Kung Fu. There's thousands of Kung Fu systems. The same like Silat. There's, for example, Indonesia alone, the, the registered system is around 600 systems. I, I can't really compare uh, the difference between Malaysian, Indonesian, and Brunei Silat because there, is, there are some systems that, that is very similar and then there are systems that is very far in the difference because it comes from a different region. So, same like Brunei. Brunei, uh, basically like maybe four or five or under 20, that is officially registered with the Federation. But the system that is not registered with the Federation, there is more as well. So uh, the system which I teach or the system which I share is more of like the old people's silat because I never jump and I never do kicks, things like that. So it's all like you're grounded, you use your gili or gelek, your pivot, to hit very hard and then as long as you know you get as long as you know to get out of the way to create an opening to strike and that is what I teach and that is what I was taught as well so what you saw in the raid that was more like the young people's silat so they've got jumping high kicks you know more speed more intense so with your training with silat as a whole uh, when you see other silat systems can you see like I know that style that guy's from Indonesia I know that's that one, that one, yes, but you can also see from the way they move or the way they dress and their mannerism when they move, then you know where, where they come from. Uh, Indonesian silat tend to be more, when, they, when you see them do this silat, they tend to go like a very low crouching style. Malaysia, sometimes, because the fighting styles tend to be more dynamic. It depends on which system. But in Brunei, you will see a mix and match. Uh, some of the system which is influenced by Indonesia or they've got Indonesian or Malaysian teachers, they tend to move a little bit like Indonesian Malaysians. But Brun uh, Brunei Silat 
is a little bit more upright, but when they train, they train low for their legs. But when they fight, they fight up. Because that's how people are. More human traits rather than it comes from an animal or it comes from this. Well, more human traits. Did you spread the art globally? No, actually no, because I'm, I'm an engineer. I was training other martial arts when I was in university. I went to Shorinji Kempo, I went to Ninjitsu because it was taught in the community hall. I, I went to Aikido, but what stuck with me was Jiu Jitsu, a, ju a Japanese Jiu Jitsu. This was before MMA or BJJ was even there, yes. Uh, this was 2001, 2000, 2000, 2001. It's already big in MMA, but there was not a lot of BJJ schools yet. And what made me want to learn Jiu Jitsu was the instructor because he knew how to, the curriculum was good, he knew how to teach. Uh, that was, I was looking, what I was looking for. The way he taught, the way he teaches, his instruction influenced me a lot in the way I teach um, uh, in Silat. Because Silat was informal. So when you teach, you teach through skill. You teach one-on-one. -on -one. But Jiu Jitsu at the time, when I was training it, he was teaching a class. So there's a difference between teaching one-on-one -on -one and teaching a group of people. So I learned a lot when he was teaching a group of people because we were in university, no? To start teaching Silat, what was like the, the catalyst, what ignited you? Like, okay, I'm going to start teaching Silat. A friend, he was attacked with a knife. So at the beginning, he was looking... Well, this was before he was attacked with a knife. So he was taking a Jiu-Jitsu class and he was a bouncer for a nightclub, yes? And he was looking how to defend against a knife. So he, he took Wing Chun, he took this, he took that, and he went into our class as well, Jiu-Jitsu class. And he was learning, and he was like telling me like, you know, I went to all these uh, martial arts classes. None of the knife defense techniques is convincing because it doesn't work. I said, why don't you, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And he was like, show, show, show me again. So I just did a basic parry and I pushed him away. Basic parry, pushed him away. So basically, when I did a basic parry and push him away, I told him that it was supposed to be a punch to your face. But um, because we're training, we push the chest. And then one day, uh, he came to my house and he had like a, a cut on his face. And he said, oh, uh, and I didn't see him before this for like maybe a week or two. And he said, uh, thank you all, you know, like not because of your training, um, I wouldn't be here. And he just had a baby at the time. He said, like, if not because of the basic uh, peri, peri and head training, that knife attack would not be in his face. It would be on his neck. So since then, he stopped working as a bouncer because that changed his whole perspective on, on, on life because he just had a baby and he got into that situation. And that's it. Yeah. So, follow through. Follow through. So basically, it was by accident. I was studying at the time and I put out a video there on, because I was training with a few other people in, when I was living in Cardiff. And they asked me, how can we continue training after you go home? So this was 2006, 2006, yes. And I was a student at the time. To buy a DVD writer was expensive, like 120 quid. I don't want to spend that much. I was a student, yes. And I told my, my friend, you know, I found this website. I will put the video there. And if I have enough money, uh, I'll burn the DVD and I'll send it to you from home, from Brunei. Just check it out. Uh, this is a, I, it, it's, I think it's a new website. I told them it's a random website. Uh, the website's called YouTube. So basically that was how it started. So if you check, I'm one of the first few people that posted on YouTube when it first came out. But because I didn't push the monetization on YouTube, I use YouTube more like um, uh, a CV, like a portfolio. So that's why you see uh, one video is knife, one video is machete, one video is this, one video is that. So it's not a mix and match of skill. It's specifically like, do you do knife defense? Yeah, watch this link. Do you turn with the staff? Yes, watch this link. And then a few months after that, I've got an email from a guy from Italy, a businessman. And he said, would you like to come to, Bruna uh, to Italy and teach us Silat for two weeks? So at the beginning, I thought it was a scam. And in the beginning, I didn't take it seriously. But then I decided to reply. I said, um, are you for real? Because nobody wants to train Silat. 
So I asked him a few questions. He answered my question. Da 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 da. And if I really agreed, he sent actually sent money. He said, "This is for real. People want to learn silat." So and then I went to Italy for ten days, and then after that, that's how everything snowballed from there. I've met Alex more than ten years ago, actually. So and I knew of Alex before he was like this big guy. I knew of Alex when he was still skinny, and I didn't know him then. And he was like he moved really well. So I, every time he posted a video, uh, I said, "You're great," you know. I gave him compliments and things like that. And then a few years after that, he came to my seminar in Germany. So before I was traveling all around Europe and the States before. Uh, because I lived in the UK, and then he went to one of my seminars in Germany, and then he went to Italy as well for the summer camp to train with me for five days. And after that, we kept in touch. And then he said, "Mo, would, like, would you like to come to to Russian house?" I said, "What's Russian house?" I thought it was only for Russians. Yes, he said, "No, we don't. We we like to we do FMA. We like to introduce Silat to it. So this is how things start. So 2019 or 2018. That's my first. So it was it was good. It was a good experience." And it was really, uh, you know, when you have like grandmasters, really high level, and they move amazing, like like super, yeah, like, like some of, like for example, Jim Bait, I I saw him like in in a book, and I didn't know I was going to meet him, like after in like 16 years, it's like shit, all these guys, you know, it's like you you, you see all your superheroes and then you meet them, you're like ah, so it was nerve wracking. And the thing is, the only thing I could do is like try my best to teach, so that I could be at their level. So you know that uh, you don't want to be lazy, and then you've got grandmasters around you watching, and sometimes, sometimes they join in. So you know, you just want to make sure. And then because of that, sometimes I forget we also have beginners. So you just jump straight into the advanced movement, and the beginners are like, "What the f is going on? What's going on? We can't we can't follow it." And then. We have to come back down so that we keep the people happy. So Alex has done a lot for the martial arts community in the Philippines, and he has influenced the Philippines Board of Tourism to also uh, to start an initiative to do uh, you know Filipino martial arts as part to attract tourism. So as which is great, which is great. Hmm? So coming from the Silat system, coming to the Philippines. Yeah. Do you feel like I'm not, you know, I'm not teaching martial arts? No, I never saw that. You know, that's why I said like in the beginning, I never saw people as different. So when I see Filipinos, I see them as Asian. When I see Indonesian, I see them as Asians. When I see Chinese, I see them as I grew up with Chinese. I grew up with Filipino. I grew up with the Nepalese. I grew up with the Indians. You know, and you know, I grew up with Indonesians right? as friends, but you know, they they are in the community. So when I came to the Philippines, it's like. The only thing different is like we don't speak the same language. That's it. So English is the is the common language. I get intimidated if I go to a country if English is not their first language. Uh, so the intimidation is more because of the language than than, than the martial arts. Uh, when Alex says, "Oh, GM Bobby Tabor is going to be here," GM Nick Elizar or GM Danny Casio, GM uh, um, Tuhan Felix will be here, you know, and I'm like, "Shit, I'll be in the same room with my superheroes." So I was more excited than you know, but hoping that I don't let them down is always there. So that's why every time I'm teaching, I try to up the game all the time. Similarities visually is there uh, when it comes to empty hands. Yes, is there, but not the same. The similarities and you see influences there. Uh, but then when it comes to the sticks, even in Balintawa, uh, Bobby Tabuada Balintawa. G, uh, GM Nick Belintawak and then uh, GM Cassius Belintawak Belisen GM Belisen even in that itself Belintawak you can see the difference in Silat you see uh, then you see the big difference as well so uh, when it comes to weapons movement um, I'm talking about what is here yes there's a difference uh, but then empty hands you see similarities especially when Uh, GM Denny Casio of Red Balintawak does it empty hands, yeah, and when he does his entry, it's similar to what we do. Uh, the difference is um, because he comes from Balintawak background, so his body mechanics is different. But visually, it's the same, like pass, hit, 
inside pit, but he does it in his flavor. Well, you know, like boxing. You know, boxing still boxing, but Manny Pacquiao moves differently. Mike Tyson does differently, but it's still boxing. It's not different, but it's, you know, you still have uh, a jab, a cross, a hook, an uppercut, but each people does it differently. So that's how I see it. Now, what are the cultural similarities between Philippines and Brunei? There's a lot, and there's there's a lot of similarities, and there's also a lot of difference because of the faith. You know, uh, that's the only thing. Uh, we don't eat pork, but the cooking I've, is familiar, uh, and the mannerism and the way they speak and the humor is similar. Uh, similar to the Filipinos that live in the Philippines. But when you meet Filipinos that live abroad or grew up abroad, then you see different because they live in different culture. But Filipinos and Philippines are very similar to uh, Brunei.